Well, Happy New Year and welcome to the January 2022 episode of Let's Talk Tech, a monthly show providing you little bites of technology. In this episode, we'll discuss the new Windows 11 update, Code Red and updating your contact info, tour the broadband building, look at fitness apps, and answer the question of the month, and of course, let's share some of our tech history tidbits. Did you know that on January 2nd, 1975, Bill Gates and Paul Allen named their company Microsoft? On January 3rd, 1977, Apple Computer was incorporated. Who wishes they bought stock back then? I sure do. And on January 24th, 1984, the Apple Macintosh was released. So this month, the last week of January is designated Data Privacy Awareness Week. Check your online security and privacy IQ by taking this online quiz at the bottom of the screen. Hi, Cheryl. Happy New Year. Hi, Debbie. I hope that you had a wonderful holiday season. Oh, I did. Thank you so much. I love the holiday season. I get to visit with all my friends and family. You know what? I even met up with the family down the street who just moved in. You know what? They had a lot of questions about the village. But they had one question that I really want you to talk about here because it's about Code Red, and I think it's really important that you talk about it so people who live here who are new and, are, and aren't new can find out what Code Red is really all about. Well, great, that's a great question, and, and that's nice of you to help your neighbors. Um, so, the, so let me try. Um, Code Red is an emergency alert system that we offer to our residents. It's very important that everyone sign up for this. In the event of an emergency or the need to broadcast critical time sensitive news, the Code Red emergency notification system transmits brief, urgent messages to the village residents. And it's as quickly as possible during either via a phone call, a text message, or an email. For example, if a fire was nearby and a potential threat, Code Red would immediately provide you with a um, uh, notification, which would be so important, of course, because we're all worried about those things. And if you've already signed up for Code Red in the past, it's important to go online and update your account and make sure that all of your contact information is current. Even for those who not, may not live here full time, um, there are many options to have emergency contacts. So let me show you how. So first, you need to go to the Laguna Woods Village website. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll find Code Red. So this tells you exactly what you're going to get with regards to messages from the Code Red system. Critical power outages, earthquake, emergency procedures, uh, evacuation, gate or road closures, safety threats, or fire. You always want to go in and even just set a calendar message to go in here once a year and update everything. So I'm going to fill it out with my name. So you're going to put your manor number and make sure you put a dash for your unit number. Then you're going to input your resident ID. And whether the manor is leased, owner occupied or vacant. And this is really important because if you're a non-resident owner, um, you know, you still might want to get the messages and then also make sure you encourage your tenant to sign up for Code Red as well. And then you're going to give your best contact number. And now this is the really important. So, you know, some of us have more than one number, some of us don't now, but make sure that you know exactly what you want them to call you on or text you on and then your email. That's really important too because if you're a person who gets your email on your phone, you would also get an email of the code red message. And then you can list some emergency contacts. So this is something you can think about. Do you want it to be a neighbor, a family member, a friend? Um, you know, one of the things you might want to consider is how quickly they can get here if they would need to get into your unit and you would fill all of that out, and then you give their phone numbers, and then your, the relationship, you make sure you click on the relationship with yourself, 
and then you can list a second emergency contact. You can also add if you have if you have your property in a trust and you have an attorney, you could add your attorney name and phone number. If uh, here's a trustee, so if you also have a trustee for your trust. And here's a really important part. If you have a pet in your home or more than one pet, you want to make sure that you put in a pet care person, whether that be a vet or a friend that would come and pick up your pet in the event of emergency, super important. You don't want your pet to be, to be frightened and you want someone to come and make sure to take care of them. And then a doctor, and this could also be important if you had an incident in your home and you were unable to contact your doctor, we would have access to be able to do this. And now these are all optional, so you don't have to give this information, but it's recommended. And all of this is completely private. This information would not be shared with anyone outside of the necessary people to read this. And then if you have any special circumstances, check the conditions that may apply to you. Um, particularly if you have any kind of um, support system or oxygen that you need to have constant uh, electricity to, that would be something to make sure you note here. And I'm going to submit my form and now we're all done and I'm back to the beginning and that's as simple as it is. So you want to make sure that you go onto the website, go to Code Red, do this as Put a note on your calendar once a year. Make sure you have the most current information here so that we can reach you in the event of an emergency. Okay, Debbie, here's the question of the month. I love the question. <laughs> <laughs> you keep talking about smart TVs, but what is that, and what devices can you buy to make a TV smart? Oh, wow. Again, I want to know that too. <laughs> Okay, smart TVs. We're always talking about how smart these TVs are. Well, as we move more and more towards streaming in our world and here in the village, I always like to talk about the options to help our residents get educated on the many options that we have and how to decide what works best for their entertainment viewing needs. So many of the new TVs are smart already, and they offer built-in apps such as Netflix and Hulu. However, even TVs that are a few years old may not have this option, but they have what's called an HDMI port, and you can plug in a device and make them smart. So there are a few devices that do this, such as Roku, and there's also an Amazon Fire Stick. A basic version of an Amazon Fire Stick is around $20, and a version with Alexa built in is about $35. Let's take a closer look at how to do this. First, when you plug the device in, you'll need to use the TV remote and change the input to the HDMI input so that the TV will talk to the device. It looks almost like a remote itself, but it's smaller. The remote for the device will take the place of your TV remote when you are accessing those apps. So you might have to have two different remotes. If you have the version with Alexa and you have the Alexa device, you can speak to change a channel, which is very cool. So you'd say, hey Alexa, change to Netflix. So these devices offer endless entertainment. You can stream more than a million movies and TV episodes from Netflix, Prime Video, Disney Plus, Peacock, and so much more. You can also listen to millions of songs. These apps are usually subscription-based, so you'll pay a monthly fee. But there are some free options. For example, if you want to li watch live TV, watch your favorite news or sports, with subscriptions to Sling TV, YouTube TV, Philo, Direct TV, and there's many others, you would use the guide button to see what's available and when, and it would put the guide on your TV. For free TV, you can access over 200,000 free movies and TV episodes from popular streaming apps like IMBD TV, Tubi, Pluto TV, and more. If you have Amazon Prime, you can listen to Amazon Music. You could also have a uh, subscription to Spotify, Pandora, and many others. 
the remotes, if they're compatible with Alexa, would let you use your voice to search and launch shows across various apps. Or they have preset buttons right on the remote that allow you to get to the app quickly. You can also control the power and volume on your TV or even a soundbar with that single remote. So if you combine one of these devices with your standard included cable from our broadband, you could have great options for viewing for a very reasonable cost. And perhaps you might even save some money. Remember, last month I mentioned making a list of what you watch regularly so that that can help you decide what subscriptions you might actually need. Thanks, Debbie. There are so many options for streaming. Hey, I'm sure that the audience really appreciates what you've just told us, and I certainly do. Well, it was a great question, so I'm glad I got to give some information. And next, we'll tour our broadband facility and chat with the general manager, Paul Artees. So here we are at the Broadband Services Center up on Vio Campo Verde, which is up near um, our garden center. And a lot of times people don't even know this is here. In fact, I, this is the first time I've been here. And with me today is Paul Ortiz, who is the director of Broadband Services. Yeah, you're Hi. right, because a lot of people are just the RV people, because we have the RV lot right behind us. And they're really probably the only residents who know that broadband is right here off of Campo Verde. And it's uh, where we have our transmission equipment and where our broadband staff uh, works out of. No, it's it's a great, I, I, I really just didn't even realize. And look, you have box remote, pick up, drop off, so everybody can do that. Um, so tell me a little bit about how long broadband services have been around and um, there's a lot of history here. There's a lot of history here. And matter of fact, one of the most interesting things about the history here in our community is that when Ross Cortese built this community in 1963 and 1964, first residents moved in September, we were probably the largest cable operation in the world. People don't realize that because Ross Cortese did not want antennas on his brand new homes. So, you know, back in the old days, we had those weird little antennas on top of everyone's home. He hated those things. So they direct bury coaxial cable throughout the entire community. They put in a master antenna that was over at Clubhouse One, and that's how cable TV actually started. And that all happened with his, you know, forward thinking and putting in coaxial cable throughout the entire community. So pretty interesting thing for us to have that kind of privilege back in 1964. I was just going to say back in the 60s I'm just thinking about being a very small child and that little tiny postage stamp sized television in my living room and um, and he had the forward thinking to, to know that where would we be today? Yeah, and, and it just happens because, you know, he just didn't like the aesthetics of an antenna. And you're right, because of his forward thinking, because the staff and the residents and the leadership of the community in the 1960s and 70s, they knew that they all of a sudden had this golden jewel in their community and they put an investment into it to make it, you know, what it is today, a fiber optic, you know, internet flying, you know, system. And we have nearly 300 channels on our cable system. No, I, I, I was very um, impressed when I first got here that I could just plug my TV in, there was a cable coming out of the wall and I got TV and I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. And, um, and I didn't have to pay extra, but you can. Um, and of course, uh, tell me a little bit more about like the fiber optics. So we're, we're set up for the future too. Well, you are set up for the future, but we do have to put some investment into it. In 1999, we rebuilt the entire cable operation. Okay. And at that time, we trenched the entire community. So just like Caltrans has been working on our freeways for about 50 years, right? right? That's what was happening here in 1999. And fortunately, we got through the project and fiber was put into the ground. That's incredible. And, and I'm part of the broadband committee. So I don't know that our residents realize that we have a full committee of board members and yourself and several other uh, VMS staff that we work ever, uh, constantly on finding the best way to bring broadband into the village. What can we do as far as um, what we for the future for streaming? Um, what is the best case scenario? And all of the research that we've done so far has proven that we've got quite a little gem right here. That's true, and we are fortunate because the broadband group did their report now a year and a half ago. They're mm -hmm. a very successful consulting firm in the industry, and we, we basically got straight A's for all the services that we're providing. 
And what we need to do now is think about what are we going to do for the next 15, 20 years? Kind of like what the people in 1995 started doing, because it was about a three-year process to get funding. They actually had to take out a bank, a bank loan from Bank of America for $10 million to do all of this, which is unusual, right, right around right, here. Right, no loans. <laughs> but um, what we need to do is find out, you know, what are, what are we going to do in the future? And we're working with the broadband group to see what, what other systems are out there similar to ours, and what are they doing? And we're really, we know we're going to go fiber deeper into the premise and deeper into the home, but we need to figure out what is the right technology and what are the costs associated with that. Right. And, you know, you made, you mentioned something that uh, just to struck a chord was that we don't, this is a very unique situation. We don't really have a lot. There's not a lot to draw from. So the broad, broadband consulting group that we've um, engaged with, you know, they are all over the country. So they're able to actually find because locally there's not a lot of this going on. Well, we're very unique even nationally because when you talk about cable operations, you're talking about Comcast, Charter, Cox Communications. They have millions and millions of subscribers. Right. Then we go and we're 13,000 subscribers. Right. So, right. you know, they can really, their capital investment can be budgeted a lot different than what we do. But we're so unique that a lot of the rural people, you know, we belong to the NCTC, which is our co-op. Yes. And fortunately for them, we get a lot of our programming uh, costs, you know, at a discount. It's kind of like a Costco of programming. <laughs> and right. of course, they help us with our hardware as well. But their membership is, their average membership is probably about 1,000, you know, subscribers for their cable operations. And here we are at 13,000. So we're pretty unique and we're uh, a kind of a big fish in a small pond. Right, but right. we're a very small fish in a very big, big lake. <laughs> it's true, though. So, and in the ocean, really. Yeah. And yet we still have the similar technologies that these other operators have. So right. we need to keep up with them. So how do we keep up with this high-tech technology and keeping on the cutting edge? Well, you know, one of the things we do is, you know, in our technology, everything is the speed of light. So we're talking milliseconds and nanometers. So we get our transmissions from satellites. And with the magic of television, we could be there like that. So here we are at the satellite dish. Look how cool this is. Yeah, that, this is our multi-sat satellite dish. And that actually picks up all of our transmissions and all of our broadcasts from all of the, sat all of the satellite providers you know, that just orbit the Earth. That transmission is then sent into our head end where we have receivers that convert them into video and, and that video is then sent through fiber, you know, through glass and glass is actually just colors of light that's send, sending this signal to your home so that you can watch ABC and NBC and all the wonderful channels we have on the system. That sounds very high tech and very expensive, yeah. Paul. So how do we do that here? Yeah, that was a simplistic way of kind of explaining how it all <laughs> happens. But we have some wonderful technicians and people that work in broadband that have been working for our system for nearly 30, 40 years now. So we're very fortunate like that. But it, it is a little bit, you know, obviously there's costs involved in running a cable operation. And we're fortunate in that cable operation has been very minimal as far as cost when you compare how high, you know, cable bills right. are out there in the real world. I think the average is about $110, $120 a month if you're lucky, right? Right, more than that even. And I think cases. here we're charging like $34 for the assessment part. Obviously, you can get a set-top box and do the other things that we have. But in 2022, we're having to raise the rates by 5%. And everybody's kind of wondering, well, why is that? Well, unfortunately, since 2003, when these broadband fees were first instituted, they were never raised within a certain period of time. They just stayed flat since 2013. During that time, you know, CPI has been one, two percent for the last right. eight years. This year, it's actually six percent. And inflation. And, yeah, we're just trying to do a little bit of catch up. So we're slowly starting to inform the residents that, you know, any of the services that we provide, that there is a five percent increase. Again, that increase is going to handle licensing fees, installation fees, labor costs, obviously, which is part of, you know, your assessment through the Golden Rain Foundation. Right. But a lot of it is the, the licensing fees and the equipment that we've been putting in to, uh, you know, get you the, the quality of service that you deserve. 
Well, we have great service here and for a very, very um, really inexpensive overall cost. So even a small 5% increase is just a few dollars. Um, and, and realistically, what we have here is such a gem. Um, and just out of curiosity, Paul, when you mentioned all the people who've worked at Braun Bam for a very long time, you've worked here a few years, right? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work worked here since 1980. Wow. And I wasn't always on the cable operations side of it, but I did move into the cable operations side in the, in the late 80s and been fortunate to kind of work my way through the company and through this industry. And uh, I'm glad to work here. I'm proud to work here. And uh, it's been a great opportunity for me. Well, we've enjoyed having you. Um, even the few years that I've lived here, I've gotten to know you and you do a fabulous job with our broadband. So I really, really thank you for that. Thank you again, Paul, for joining me today. And we want to let the community know that you can be a part of this decision making as well by joining our Media and Communications Committee, which meets monthly. And we discuss things like our broadband, so we would like you to join us. And when we come back, we're going to be discussing fitness apps because it is January and everybody's worrying about their fitness. January is typically the time of year we are all looking to get back on track by exercising more, eating better, and considering our overall health. So I'd like to talk for a few minutes about apps for fitness that you might be interested in. The first app is called MyFitnessPal, and I've been using this one for years. Not only does it connect to, with a smartwatch and phones, but it also lets you track diet and exercise. You can even scan barcodes of various food items or find them already loaded into their database. I really like it because if I log my food, it keeps me honest about my daily calories. It also keeps track of exercise and more. All of that is at no charge, and you can upgrade to more features for a small monthly fee. Another app called Runtastic, which is now by Adidas, will keep track of walking, running, and biking for free, and offers additional tools, such as setting up a workout each day. This is a great app if you're a walker here in the village. Another cool tool that I've successfully used is the podcast called Couch to 5K, which is very motivational. Now they have an app for that. This doesn't mean you have to go out and run a race, but this works well to get a sedentary person up and moving in a very safe and logical manner. If you already own an iWatch and an iPhone, they also offer several built-in health applications that keeps track of activity levels, such as steps per day, heart rate, and more. I use my iWatch all the time now for health and exercise monitoring. I used to use Fitbit, which is still a really good option, or even a Garmin watch when I was doing more athletic endeavors and hiking because it had built-in GPS as well. Many apps have free trial periods too, so you can take advantage of a month and see if you like it. There are many other apps out there depending on your interests, from yoga to CrossFit. Just do a search and you'll find many. So here's to a new year, new you. I'll be right there with you getting fit and healthy. And next we'll discuss the new Windows operating system update. If you are a PC user, you may have heard that Microsoft has a new operating system called Windows 11. Any PC you would buy now would come with this version of this operating system. However, your current computer, depending on its age, may be upgradable to the new operating system for free, but maybe not. You'll have to check some specifics on your computer and decide if you even want to update, which it's really too detailed to cover in our brief time on the show. But not to worry, if you want to stay with what you have, Microsoft will support Windows 10 for many years to come. But if you do want more information on whether you can, can or should update, please visit our PC workshop on the third floor of the community center, and they would be happy to help you connect with someone to dig deeper and also watch their calendar for any upcoming classes on that topic. In the meantime, let me go over some of the changes you might see with Windows 11. The biggest initial differences are the look and feel. Microsoft is copying an Apple style with excellent graphics and a different home screen look. That is probably the most visible change from what you might be used to with your current desktop view. If you use folders or shortcuts like I do. 
I don't like to admit it, but I do like those desktop shortcuts. However, Windows 11 has easy to use tools that can help you optimize your screen space and make you much more productive. You can personalize your content feed with widgets so you can quickly see all the things you like to keep tabs on, such as weather, sports, your schedule, and your to-do list. You can also catch up on news at a glance. Now you can see it in all one place with just a quick left swipe of your screen. I think that is really sleek and a much nicer user experience. So when I update to Windows 11, I'm going to embrace those new features. You can also manage passwords with Microsoft Edge, and we've talked a lot about security and passwords here. So when signing into the sites, if you're using the Edge Microsoft browser, it will offer to save your passwords and automatically fill them in for you, similar to what Google Chrome does, which is still my preference. I would mention, though, that creating strong passwords, no matter which browser you use, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and be sure to check your saved passwords regularly in these browsers and make sure they're always updated. So sadly, scams during the holidays were rampant, not only online, but also here in our village, where we are averaging about one per week that are reported to authorities such as the Orange County Sheriff. If something sounds too good to be true, it's likely a scam. It's best to be cynical and assume the worst, which is sad to say. Do your research before handing over a penny. Ask your family or friends what they think of any type of request that you receive. Just be on the defense when it comes to possible scams. It's unfortunate that we have to stay constantly on guard. For example, here's an email I recently received from the Social Security Info Administration about scams, and it's really good information to remember. So I'm going to share it here. They give great advice. Speaking of advice, I'd like to remind you all about the misinformation and disinformation still rampant on the internet. Although social media can keep you connected to family and friends, it can also be a slippery slope of inaccuracies. Rumors may be started with something quite innocent, often a complaint which has a small amount of truth but is quickly blown out of proportion. Or perhaps a person who decides that they will use social media to create their own personal soapbox and post disinformation. You've heard of a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? So what's the solution when using social media? Because let's face it, we all like it. My best suggestion is don't believe everything you read. Sometimes a small fact becomes embellished or changed to the writer's perspective. Fact check, fact check, fact check. Don't get drawn into the drama of others. And remember, a post on the internet is forever. If you wouldn't say it to a person's face, considering not posting it at all either. I know that I mention this frequently on the show, and I'd really do it with a purpose. Remember, misery loves company, and there are viable solutions for every problem, but they won't be solved on social media. It's human nature, though, to want to read about it, but just read it and leave it there. Another thing I'd like to mention, although not necessarily a scam, is taking a few steps towards safety when hiring a freelance computer tech to help you with your computer. The PC Club has a list of vetted individuals, but if you find someone on your own or on social media, that's fine. Just be sure to get a few references and check them before you give your personal access to your passwords or other personal data to fix your computer. Better to be safe than sorry on that one. So we are at the end of our time already. Next month, we'll discuss online money apps, safety when online banking, two-factor authentication, avoiding cyber nightmares, using your phone for more than calls and texts, and as a note, I'm teaching a workshop on online banking and apps on January 11th at 1 p.m. in the PC Education Center. So if you're interested, please go to their website and sign up, or you can register the same day. We really appreciate you joining us today. Our show now airs on Friday at 10.30 a.m. on Village TV or on the Village TV YouTube channel at any time. Subscribing's easy. We also have a Facebook page, Instagram, and more. 
We'd love to hear from you with your comments, your questions, anything. Remember, be kind when posting online and stay safe by updating your privacy settings regularly. I want you to know how much I appreciate you watching my show and have a great day. Thank you.